Today, I'm sitting here with a very, very, very special couple of guests here. We have Florian Caps, founder of The Impossible Project, extremely essential figure in any Polaroid film existing whatsoever today, and Chris Holmquist, who he's partnered with to produce One Instant Film, the new Peel Apart film produced by Florian's company, SuperSense. And uh, I am sitting with them, they're just on this computer. Um, so we're gonna have a little chat today. Let's get into it. The kind of photography that would become part of the human being. Press a button and have the picture. So I wanna flash us back to 2008, Polaroid going under. It's a devastating moment for everybody. Um, Doc, I wanna go inside your brain for a second. And what, what did you think when you first heard this news and what was the first thing you did when you learned that Polaroid was going out of business? You know, I, I knew about it a little earlier than, you know, it was publicly announced because, you know, I was one of their, their biggest um, distribution and retail partners. Um, the only one who had an online shop back then specialized on Polaroid uh, materials. So they called me and, and <laughs> they said, hey, doc, we have good news. You know, finally, we we basically switch over to, you know, to, to be ready for the digital revolution. And the, uh, by the way, we also closed down the, the last film factory. So please, you know, place your last order. So it was a very optimistic call. And I said, hey, what, 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 can you repeat that? What exactly? Yeah, you know, it's sync, the sync product is going to take off. It's, you know, basically the same like film, but it's, you know, with little um, dyes in a little paper by heat. We're gonna send you some samples. You're gonna love it. And I said, "Can we? Can you repeat the part about the factories so <laughs> oh closing God. down the last factory?" I said, "Yeah, yeah, it's about time." So this was, you know, half, you know, half a year before they officially announced it. And you know, as you can imagine, from that moment on, I said, "Hey, we have to talk about it. You know, this cannot be. You know, you cannot be serious about it. There must be." Um, other ways to, to look at it because, you know, my business is just about to start. Look at my, you know, we have 40,000 young generation photographers all over the world who just started to fall in love with Polaroid. You must be kidding me. This is the beginning and not the end of Polaroid. So this is how I, I couldn't, you know, simply believe it. And until now, um, I, you know, I was never able to accept that. <laughs> so I behaved like, you know, this is just a big mistake, it's a misunderstanding. And um, um, yeah, that's how it all started. Wow. And so how did you acquire the first factory? Like, what was your first step? Yeah, I know you went to the, the conference, um, the, like the closing this, ceremony. This was also the last step. You know, I tried everything. I talked to everybody. Um, you know, I wrote letters. I, I, I you know, I, I... I frightened the, to kill them, you know, the whole program. <laughs> I, I, I said I'm going to dance naked on the street with, uh, you know, uh, whatever. But I basically everything failed. So their invitation to the closing event was just the only outcome of, of, of me half a year trying everything. So it was already the end. So they said, you know, we invite you to watch the last day, so you finally get it that we're closing. Oh my God. And uh, the crazy thing, so the fate of this was that I met the, you know, the small team of, of uh, you know, uh, that of managers and Andre Bosman, who was responsible for closing down this factory. And he has spent the last two years to think about possible scenarios of, uh, you know, how they could continue the production, but nobody listened to him either. So, and at the party, the, the two of us connected and we found out that, hey, if we, if we connect our so-called superpowers, at least they felt like superpowers after 15 Grolsch beer on that day, <laughs> we can, we can, you know, we should give it a one last try. So what we agreed on, on that day, because I had the customers and he had the knowledge of how you know, we could potentially uh, give it another try in, in production. That he um, didn't didn't open the doors to the scrap team on the next day, which was really the next day. 
So we, we, we win some more time and together we go back to the Puerto Red management and try to fight, you know, now united and not just me as a crazy guy from Vienna, but also supported by a small team of dedicated workers at the Puerto Red factory. And this was the beginning of, of, of the, the, you know, slowly the, the game changing. Chris, where were you during this time? And like, what, I mean, did you expect to ever get involved in something like this? No, that's <laughs> funny because I can tell you exactly where I was. In, in 2008, I just graduated from the University of Kansas in Lawrence. Um, and I was a recently employed in a very boring office job. And I was just actually getting into analog photography through the forums. And like APUG, for instance, was was kind of my first window into the analog photo world. And I knew about Doc and I knew about the Impossible Project. And I bought some of this terrible first black and white. <laughs> <laughs> but so, yeah, it was really, um, no, if you had told the 2008 self that in 12 years I would be working here, I, I would, or working for Doc at least, no, I would not have believed that. Man. But yeah, so I think it was crazy. I think Doc to this generation does sort of represent this, yeah, I don't want to give him too much credit, but the savior of uh, <laughs> no, yeah, I think that's understood. That's amazing. So we've got the, the factory up and running. Um, I'm curious, Doc, was <laughs> what, where was your brain at in terms of Pacom at this point? Because obviously Fuji had their product. So uh, were you just sort of comfortable with the fact that Fuji had their product or were you constantly thinking, oh, that might be a concern at some no, point? The, the back film was, you know, this was, for me, this was, was much, the, the whole back film was much more stupid than even the worst communication with Polaroid. Because, you know, first of all, back in the 2008, um, I already, I also wanted to save the, the back film machines. Okay. And, um, uh, you know, we, we succeeded on the 8x10 system, so we could uh, get this over from, um, from Voltem in the U.S., but we never had a chance uh, regarding uh, the production of back film because um, Fuji right away uh, secured uh, all, the, all this back film. So they, what they agreed with Polaroid, so before I could purchase the factory, that Polaroid scraps or you know dismantles all pack film machines because Fuji is gonna take care of the Polaroid pack film production in Japan. So what they did is they uh, they produced Polaroid film and Fuji film under the different names. Wow, uh, really? Uh, <laughs> so this is what what happened. So uh, in 2009-10, uh, the the production of Polaroid pack film continued, but. What they what they did is you know basically they fucked over the Polaroid management because from the moment on um, they they produced both they just reduced the price of the Fuji film which was exactly the same like the Polaroid film by half so nobody bought the Polaroid film and you know they won all the market of the back film so very soon um, you know Polaroid um, stopped uh, stopped the production or stopped the agreement with Fuji and. Then, you know, at the time uh, when I really thought, okay, and no analog medium has to die anymore after, you know, the comeback of the vinyl record of the, this incredible comeback of the Fuji Instax of, you know, the success story of Polaroid. Then suddenly they say they're going to stop back film. And I couldn't believe that. He said, hey, guys, you know, haven't you learned the lesson? There is a new generation of this back film. And, and, you know, let's, and, I, and you know, this was really painful that, you know, they, they stopped that because, you know, it, I couldn't understand it. And I tried very hard to talk to them and they, you know, they didn't want to talk to me. And, you know, even if I had the support of investors, of, you know, there was no way until now. I don't know what happened to the machines. I don't know, you know, what exactly how, you know, it, it's very, very strange. And, yeah. Then heaven sent me Chris. <laughs> what was did was Chris's involvement directly parallel to Fuji announcing that they're discontinuing the film, and then you wanting to start SuperSense, or you know, Doc originally with the guy Uwe Mimun, um, they had years before I think I was even 
born. No, I'm kidding. But, um, <laughs> the problem is in the picture, they did have this concept of the paper cartridge. When did that start, Doc? Was that no, after? Basically, it, it was a long process. So I, I, you know, first thing, I tried to go to Fuji and talk to them, buy the machines. That didn't succeed. So and I said, okay, I don't know what to do anymore. And then um, our our you know friend and investor David Bonnet, he just said, okay, guys, don't stop believing in it. You know, I give you a small budget. Um, just you know, look for forget about Fuji, forget about the machines. Try to think completely out of the box. You know, talk, travel the world, look at partners. You know, uh, start from a white sheet of paper. So that's what we did. But you know, as you know, us, I had 15 other projects on the, right. you know, all the going on, you know, we had to say vinyl record, we have to do this, we have to open a restaurant, we, a lot of, you know, impossible projects. So, um, and, you know, we, we, we had no sp specific project, but when Chris came, you know, he had an amazing idea. I think it was, you know, another dream of, of, uh, of him, you know, correlated to, to photography. So I said, hey, anyhow, you know, we need you. We need a dark room. We hadn't, you know, we didn't even have a dark room. Uh, let's start with the dark room. You know, no matter where where this is all going, um, if you want to really look at analog photography, we have to establish a dark room. So it all started. And I had this other guy who came up with this first mind blowing solution of 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 the mo most obvious problem of back film. It's this origami style, you know, thing of mm. ten. You know things, you know, because every time I try to figure it out, you know, it blows your mind. It's so complicated. It's 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 a nightmare. It looks easy, but it's super complicated. And based on that, we made the Kickstarter. And the Kickstarter, uh, even then, Chris was not involved. And the Kickstarter, you know, it took off. And you know, we sold eighteen thousand packs of this one shot. Uh, you know, idea that we, you know, yes, we had a a working prototype but then when we started doing the math we said oh my god you know we do all of this by hand it's gonna take us six years to, to do all of that you know oh my god so so ooh, we basically we were really happy when the kickstarter stopped and we didn't sell any more books and then i said hey chris by the way uh can you help maybe to convert this dream into reality and maybe not spend six years, you know, can you help looking at that? And luckily, um, Chris really fell in love with that, um, with this project and he did incredible, you know, changes and, you know, it, it, he, this big, this big problem, whatever you do from a working prototype to a mass production, you know, this is rocket science, and uh, this is what what Chris and his team did um, over there. And uh, this is also the basis why you know we are sitting here still producing, and not only still producing, but um, really are on the edge of um, you know introducing and thinking about the next generations of, of this. Right. Um, so so for those of who haven't shot with with super Sen or one instant film what is like the fundamental difference between this and prior pack films it's it's much simplified in that it, it's just one shot obviously so from a user standpoint you know with the fuji or the polaroid you just kind of put it in the back of the camera and shut the door and then you have these little tabs you can pull out with ours you have to thread this one main tab through the uh, rollers and that's in the beginning, the only fundamental sort of mechanical difference. Obviously, the materials are very different. And because of our relationship with the 20 by 24 studio, um, we're getting to use like the old Polaroid legacy materials. So we're using a material called P7. And I forget which one John told me, but I think, was it 669? It's 669. It's a t shirt you're wearing. So I think it was only used in this, yeah. this pack film, yes. And it's old, but it's still in really good shape. It's been refrigerated and they've got large rolls of it. Um, and the pods are the kind of trickiest thing, but the 20 by 24 studio, and these guys are outside of Boston, they still make the, the pod chemistry fresh and seal it in the pods. Now the thing is that these pods are designed for the 20 by 24. 
and or the eight by 10 system. So they're really big and baggy, you could say. And that does cause issues with like the pack film format. But so I like to say it's like a hack. Like we've sort of taken, the more and more we work on it, I learned like we should just copy <laughs> Fuji and Polaroid as closely as possible because it's amazing as, as you look at closer detail of what they did, the things in the beginning that didn't seem necessary, I have learned why they did it this way. Why was this piece of paper right. here? Why is there a cut up here? Things that were not immediately obvious. We're still learning that um, a lot. So I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> no, yeah, no, definitely. Um, it's and better than the old shit, I can tell you right away. That's the biggest difference. <laughs> <laughs> so with, with P7, with P7, I mean, one of the things about P7 is that it's obviously going to run out. Um, is that is that something you guys have a very good idea of when that's going to happen and what to do next? Or you know, we don't know exactly because you know um, we don't know exactly how how the market is developing and also you know uh, how how at the moment the limitation is that we still do every single pack in in all steps by hand. So uh, the question is how how you know can we get the production more efficient, how many packs we can do. But um, we have at least one and a half to two years, um, you know, of the supply. And I think this is, this has, it's not bad news. This is very good news because this is already a push in our lazy asses that we should think about um, what is, what is after that. So um, we are, we started already a process um, of, of developing new materials and surprisingly there are many options out there you know there are many other crazy guys all over the world that started to rescue factories or even started to produce um film materials in in their attic or in the cellar you know you know about ferrania yeah. you know my crazy friends in, in italy um you have heard about new 55 who basically they coated their I mean, this i love these guys they, <laughs> When, when I visited these guys and, you know, I saw their their hand coating machine that they did their positive with, which was basically, you know, the, the, it was made out of hair dryers and plywood parts. It was called, <laughs> it's called the thing. And they, you know, it was mind blowing because I spent so much money, time and energy in, in you know, rescuing this, this Polaroid factory and I had fixed costs of, whatever, 70,000 euro for electricity, even if the machines are not turned on. And everybody said, you know, it has to be that machine and it has to be that complicated. And this guy <laughs> go to the flea market and, you know, <laughs> and build this machine. You know, this, this was the biggest inspiration of to that there are, are new ways and it needs new ways uh, to, uh, to rethink it. It's, especially because also the the demand has changed so dramatically. You know, right. We're not talking about millions of packs. We, you know, this makes me so proud for one instant. We are totally independent. We, you know, have a, a small team of ten young people. We are basically um, small unit, um, and we, we produce it and can scale it up step by step without the big pressure. Without you know having um, investors in our back or we having huge bank loans and you know we started this crowdfunding and uh, this is this is a very beautiful approach which i think is, is necessary to slowly build this business and develop it over time so yeah. we, we have some very promising solutions to replace um the the old p7 which is important to start by new materials amazing that's great to hear um, the new 55 stuff is awesome and I was it's cool that you guys met I was curious what that was like to like do you guys when you meet each other are you just sort of swapping stories or are you thinking well maybe we could collaborate in some regard I know they wanted to make a type 100 film at some point I'm not sure whether that's you know I'm I'm a big fan of, of Bob Crowley you know he's he's you know, even before New 55, he's a genius investor. And, you know, they, they were neighbors with the, the 20 by 24 studio. Right, yeah. So I spent many amazing nights uh, with, with Bob 
and uh, uh, you know discussing all different. And he also, you know, I do a lot of music projects, and you know, he invented an incredible microphone back in the years. So he he's amazing, and um, I I you know I even started to work together with them, and I started to build this distribution of New Fifty Five in in Europe. But I have to say, my heart was. Uh, never very you know much very close to the the four by five inch because uh-huh. it's a niche in the niche in the niche. Right, right, right. I always said you know we have to get in the, in the smaller format or we have to upgrade it to the bigger format to the eight by ten. The new still now you know I tried to fall in love with the four by five inch cameras and the Crowdflex and whatever. Yeah. I, I never you know it was very but you know I'm happy that they started to to you know still continue the production. Um, by hand and um, you know amazing guys it seems like with your one shot per pack situation you're sort of positioning like you were saying with peel apart there's only a certain demand but also what what's going on when you get that box of one instant it's putting a lot of value into each shot and i'm curious if like philosophically that's something you want to keep the one shot per pack style or whether you want there to be more shots when you eventually figure out like how to pull that off we're working on a multi-shot okay so it's not no it's not i don't think it's a philosophical reason i think it was a practical necessity in the beginning Mm -hmm. um but actually getting two or three shots into a cartridge is is definitely the direction we want to go because what that does is it makes it more affordable and i mean i don't think i'm telling tales out of school if i say we know our product is expensive, but the truth is it's almost not expensive enough for how much hand labor is put into it. So I guess maybe there are people out there that think we're sort of gouging or something, but the truth is we're almost doing the opposite. And yeah, so anything we can do to make it more efficient helps us and helps like the customer. And so that is, I would say that's my goal. And I think that's what But But that said, you know, also the, the meaning of, of instant film has changed dramatically back to, you know, when it originally was invented. So, um, you know, I would also say it has a philosophical point to that because, you know, um, this one shot as a startup very much liked it because, you know, even that it's so fucking expensive, <laughs> it's, it's added value because you really have to think about it. And, you know, if you sh- and it's, it will never replace an iPhone or a digital camera. It's it's just something um, very special for very special moments that you know, appreciate and you know that the cartridge is made of paper and, and you know works as a paper holder. Um, I think that's that's also important to understand. And but that said, um, it has many good reasons to to you know have not just one but more. Mm-hmm. But we we will never try to have it eight or ten like you know this is first of all impossible uh and on the other hand i think also not necessary of um, what we want to do because like with polaroid we want to to build a new customer base and a new awareness um to instantly we want to build a future rather than to just keep a dinosaur alive and this is very important and uh you know usually the, the old guys have the tendency to really grill our asses, you know, you can, you know, when, when we brought our new, um, you know, uh, PX films on the impossible brand and suddenly, you know, the price of a pack of film was 24 US dollars compared to $9 and instead of color, 10 images, it has um, eight sepia tone images that disappeared after 15 seconds. So <laughs> you can imagine uh, the old guys, the traditional Polaroid yeah. lovers, they hated us. And what saved our asses are the young generation that grew up digitally and they said, wow, this is special. This is an experiment, you know, this is, this is an adventure. And um, this is also, you know, our invitation for, for one instant. Yeah. And, and when you saw those first impossible shots come to life and the first Super Sense peel, one instant coming to, and you're seeing an image, what does that feel like for you? <laughs> like, does that... It's like a baby being born or yeah it, this is <laughs> you know it, it was it was it was much more difficult for for polaroid because basically with polaroid we had to invent a whole new chemical system without, right you know really knowing anything about it and you know ilford the Harman technology guys gentlemen they saved our aspect then 
Um, for, for one instance, it was more mechanical problems of sorting out this crazy pack film folding structure. And we could start working with the, with the, you know, a system that we knew um, is, it works. But yes, always when you, the first time you see something appearing, even if it's just shadows, um, it, that's, that's, that's uh, like, you know, an analog orgasm for the eyes, <laughs> definitely. It's like the darkroom magic. I mean, anyone who in a darkroom sees the picture come out for the first time is in love with it, probably. I, could, I think I did maybe, I don't know, countless um, mechanical paper tests. I did this for weeks before I ever tried to make a picture. Right. And, the, and then within, I think, three tries of actually putting a pot on there and, and trying to go in the dark room and load good film, I, the third time I got a really bad picture, and this was really fantastic. That's <laughs> <laughs> so the old find. You know, Chris always comes over and says, I'm going to show you the new prototype. And then they pull out paper stuff and I said, can we look at the fucking image? You, know? <laughs> oh, you want to see a real image? See, that's what it's all about. But I want to show how smooth it is. Show me the image. Let's put some pots in there. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, so, Doc, I want to sort of hear why why saving pack film was so important to you. Why why this mission? It has many aspects. Number one. You know, pack film was always my, my favorite medium. I think, you know, uh, because of this, you know, that you have to peel it apart, that you're much closer to the chemistry, that you smell it, that you can have all this, 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 um, this you know, you can peel it, you can, you know, make the lifts, the transfers. It's a much open, a much more anti-digital system. And I also love this, you know, these high quality cameras from back there, you know, the old style. So it was always very close, close to my heart. So um, that's, that's one aspect of that. Uh, the second aspect is that, you know, I did several um, mistakes on my, on the crazy Polaroid journey that uh, ended up that, you know, even if you saved the, the format, um, Many things um, were, were said to me about, you know, the communication and the way it was positioned and, and also, you know, that the it became more and more dependent on investors. And so I said, okay, um, I hate to make mistakes, but, you know, I always love to learn from that mistakes. And um, suddenly this peel apart um, project became a chance to, to basically use everything that we learned um, very painfully uh, and, uh, you know, try it again and, and take it in our hands and this time develop this much more closer to, to uh, you know, with a smaller team, much more closer to the customs. Uh, for example, crowdfunding that was not, you know, invented out there in 2008. So to start it with a crowdfunding campaign, uh, this was already an incredible start, uh, in, you know, to do something and now step by step, um, also, you know, work with a network, a global network, and not try everything on our own. And, you know, we have a lot of dreams and uh, also regarding hardware that are, you know, basically should be an invitation and open source developments and connect to, you know, all these crazy people out there. They want to get their hands dirty and to do something and to build small companies in a world where the big companies, you know, have more and more... Um, more and more power. I think there's a lot of things going on that this one instant is also a very important sim symbol for. Uh, it's much more than just about analog instant photography. It's about creativity, um, crazy projects, um, crowdfunding, um, and just, you know, analog aspects of life. Yeah. And why, why in general have you dedicated so much of your life to instant film? What do you think? Because um, I, I was too stupid to really start a dark room and I loved analog photography. And, you know, it was for me the, the perfect combination of something very, very analog and something very simple and, you know, right in your hands right away. You know, this combination is, is still key to me. This is really um, the, most, the most, for me, you know, special, special invention in photography to combine 
you know, both worlds. And also, you know, the first product they did is, is the Instant Lab. So it was, you know, basically a, a camera to take pictures from your iPhone to convert it. I'm not an analog preacher and say, you know, digital is bad. No, I, you know, we want to think about ways to combine analog and digital aspects. And as we are still analog human beings, I think that's, that, that's important to do. And luckily, also the young generation like Chris, you know, not just the old idiots like myself, they, you know, they go for it, they feel it, they say, okay, there's something special about it. Chris, does that ring true to you? I would say I probably wasn't so into instant. I was more of the dark room. Right. And I was in Rochester for six years working at the Eastman Museum. Um, so I like the history. And I really like the history of manufacturing. And so, you know, my fun is to learn about dry plate coating machines from <laughs> 1990. But I think what Doc envisions is this future of manufacturing for analog products. And I think I think we're seeing like it's, there's so many people on, online, on Instagram, um, that are doing these really cool projects with Arduinos and Raspberry Pis to make control of things that are making, you know, antiquated photo materials. So this excites me. And, um, you know, Kodak, if you had a pilot coding machine at Kodak that would be used just in a lab setting in the 60s, today this is a production coding machine. Like, that's where the level of demand is. And I think this is, is what is exciting us is to, yeah, like what Doc said earlier about rescaling, because it's a different time after the digital uh, apocalypse or whatever. But, <laughs> but yes, so it's, it's a new time for the makers and the young kind of viewpoint on how to do this. And throughout this whole process, what is the, you don't have to pick one thing, but what's something you've learned, both of you, in this, you know, through trial and error, uh, whether it's a philosophy thing, whether it's something through business, whether it's just, you know, a personal, you know, what's, what's something you've taken away from this insane journey? <laughs> yeah, the first of all is, you know, as, as, you know to accept that um, some products, um, you know, that, you know, big companies, you know, I, well, how to say it, I fight it very long with Polaroid management to, you know, persuade them to continue production. For them, it absolutely made no sense because you know, no big company can really downscale. You know, nobody listens to a manager that says, hey, I have a great business plan. Next year, we make half the turnover with this product. They say, wow, what is going on? So, number one, it's important to, to reschedule and uh, to to basically try to build a, a structure that perfectly match to new demand as, as in the origin of building something new. And, you know, the happiest thing about this one instance project is that, you know, based on all the learnings and based on, on us doing this for so long and so building a network and having some experience. So, for example, you know, we have been in the situation that Polaroid cannot produce 8 by 10 at the moment because, you know, they're, right. I don't know exactly, but for a very long time, it's not available. So, and I said to Chris, hey, Chris, um, with all the experience, can we, can you know, make me some 8 by 10s You know, I would love, uh, we have a shooting next weekend. Um, let's, you know, it shouldn't be that, that complicated. So, and, and, you know, Chris, maybe you can show. Sure. So Chris said, "Yeah, why not? Let's try. You know, we have some experience on the race. We have some experience. You know how exactly it works. I explain it, and we put some envelopes. And and then you know. Oh we, my we God! Did. Look at that. So we did this is in color. Wow. Of the P7, for example. So it's basically just a huge one instant. Right. Laser cut parts, hand assembled. Wow, so, that is amazing. Yeah. So the very first test, you know, not even, you know, optimizing anything. So this was always my dream come true that, you know, we have a manufacturer where, you know, we can start, um, you know, producing our own materials, our own formats, play with it uh, and, and build a complete new market, which is, is small, independent, but also flexible. And, uh, you know, a lot of things can happen uh, also regarding hardware, you know, because so much has changed. Uh, over the years, and there is so much, uh, you know, handcraft power out there, uh, and uh, you know what Fuji and Polaroid is doing is super nice. They have amazing materials, but um, you know they are very, very boring in some other aspects. And you know, it's in our hands to 
to keep interests and take care of these markets, directly talk to you and send out invitations of you know doing doing amazing projects together. So that's that's our dream. That's kind of an interesting point. Um, that I mean, we don't need to criticize Polaroid at all. I love Polaroid, obviously, but um, there is a, a feeling that the heart a little bit has been morphed into a little bit something more corporate because they have to compete with Instax. Um, so is part of your mission essentially to keep that soul alive? And do you even agree with what I just said? You know, Polaroid is Polaroid. And, you know, there is, a, you know, there is many, many discussions also, you know, about, uh, you know, the change from impossible project. You know, many think, wow, you know, it's a cool story for me, you know, that the impossible project bought the Polaroid brand. You know, it's an amazing story. On the other hand, I'm, I'm sad because, you know, the impossible project, uh, the name was, you know, chosen because of the most important aspect of, of, of that company, which was to do things that big companies can't do, or, you know, to be as to be closer to the customers than, you know, a big company can be. And uh, this has changed. And, um, but, you know, this, you know, if you ask me, Am I sad that I'm not, you know, CEO or CSO or president of the honorary, honoris causa or whatever of Polaroid? Yes, sometimes I am. But on the other hand, sitting here with Chris and you and, you know, looking our, at our handmade crazy films, uh, this is the best situation I've ever been in. You know, it was absolutely no fun to have this giant, uh, you know, factory in the Netherlands. And I really have to respect investors and the you know family Smolokovsky for for doing all of that they spend an incredible amount of money and you know things and they do it differently than i have uh, you know would do it but let's not look back i think you know all of this learning and all of this heart and soul hasn't vanished but you know it's now put into structures and in materials and products and and visions that are they they're perfectly taking care of of what we started with the impossible project, um, even if it's a different name. That's a great answer. Um, and then like long-term for SuperSense, long-term for one instant, do you see, what do you see that future as? Do you see it as sort of just trying to keep something alive? Or you were just mentioned maybe building into different formats, creating a universe of analog things. What's your dream for it? You know, I'm not, quite sure if we should first purchase Polaroid and then Fuji or first if we should purchase by Fuji and then Polaroid. No, <laughs> it's not a, it's just a joke. No. <laughs> um, the thing is the, you know, I want to really, you know, take this chance of, of one instant and, uh, and, you know, this network that we have and, you know, this experience people we have to really, you know, this is my last chance to get it right regarding instant photography. So we are, we are thinking really about a small portfolio of a really amazing products. Um, and this also includes, you know, maybe different formats and also, you know, for sure it also includes um, some dreams we have about hardware because it always needs new hardware. Um, that's, you know, that's also what we've done with Polaroid to connect to the new generation of, of customers. And they're totally different. You know, the whole, the whole material, the whole medium is totally different than it has been back in the 60s or 70s. And this should be a, an incredible inspiration to think about new ways to, to open this medium for for new customers and also new new applications and, and, and new ways of photography. So that's 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 our vision for the moment. And you know, grow organically, um, step by step. Um, focus on on building the market. In, you know, with with a with a clear home base uh, and the manufacturing. And then, you know, work with partners. So the other mistake we did with Polaroid is, you know, we, we did too much on our own. Now we, we build networks for distribution, for communication, for hardware. You know, there are many, many people, amazing people out there um, just to connect them and, you know, 
welcome projects together. This this is our vision for you know the next steps. Awesome. And if anyone out there can three D print a uh, <laughs> Polaroid processing bag, you know, shoot us a <laughs> yeah. Uh, we'll get the whole. We'll get the uh, the fans working on that. Um, well, guys, uh, thank you first of all for your time, but also thank you for making this amazing film. I have some hanging right here. Three of my shots I've put in a row. Oh, amazing! That's great. I just, I just think this stuff That's is unbelievable. Too good. That's too good. Wow. <laughs> was that, was that one box? That was one box of the October batch. Just like you know. This Fuji, this looks like boring Fuji. It's too good. No, it's it's got its warmth to it. I love it. <laughs> awesome, man. Wow, nice framing job. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I felt like uh, it's a nice little triptych of of Super Sense memories. So, um, obviously, I'm a huge fan of what you guys are doing, and um, it's an honor to have you both on. What you've done is incredible, and I cannot wait to see. I, you know, you have such original brains. I can't wait to see what happens next for, for Super Sense in one instant. So thank you for watching in an instant. I hope you enjoyed this lovely conversation with two just icons in this industry. Go ahead and smash that subscribe button. Stay tuned for more views, tips, more interviews, and all things instant. Bye.